I always think if, when, and as soon as are great boundary words, because those are ways that we say, you know, I'm happy to help you and I'll do it as soon as, or I'll do it when, or if you give me the information, I'd be happy to get that for you. You're listening to the Redefining Wealth podcast with Patrice Washington. In today's episode, I sit down with communication expert, Sarita Maven. She says that ladies... It's time for us to ask for what we want. Hey there, this is Patrice Washington from patricewashington.com where we chase purpose, not money. I am so excited to be continuing the Powerful Woman series in honor of Women's History Month. Last week, we kicked off with my girl, Maddie James. We talked about the responsibility of influence And my, 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 the response has been phenomenal. So if you haven't heard that episode, make sure you go back and listen. A big shout out to all my OG listeners and my purpose chasers all over the world. Welcome back, you guys. And for those of you who are brand new, here's what you need to know about us. We are a community that believes that wealth is more than money and material possessions. So here at Redefining Wealth, we believe and we focus on the fact that wealth is all about well-being. And we have six foundational pillars that I always say, I think you need to go all the way back to the initial episodes in late 2017 and get familiar with what those are. But I'm thinking probably upcoming, I'm going to do a refresher so I don't have to keep sending you all the way back. (laughs) But for now, go all the way back and check those episodes out. I want you to know all about the six pillars. This episode falls into the people pillar. And this is all about how we communicate. And I was so thrilled when I met Sarita at an event last year. She really blew me away. And I was saving her for something special like this powerful woman series, because I believe that the better we are able to communicate It is definitely going to help us show up more powerfully in our relationships and get to the wealth that we desire. This episode is for you if you ever find yourself being uncomfortable having those conversations that just require us to get comfortable. I want you to be comfortable being uncomfortable because it's going to just make you so much better in so many areas of your life. And this goes for personally and professionally. Now, before I jump into this episode, I have to thank you so much. I've already been receiving all of your birthday messages. Yes, by the time this episode airs, Friday, March 15th will be my birthday. Shout out to all of my March babies out there in particular. I mean, I love everybody, but you know, special place in my heart for fellow March babies. I am turning 38 tomorrow And I couldn't be more thrilled about the journey. I truly am. I'm one of those people who is looking forward to my 40s, okay? Because I just am. What a great place to be in. I don't have all the insecurities of what people think about me and not being certain of myself and sure of what my purpose is that I had in my early 20s. Made a lot of money, but didn't have a lot of peace. And to be at a place now where I feel purposeful and peaceful and I know I'm profitable in what I do every day, like, man, this is a good space to be in. And I appreciate you guys so much for the love that you share and show each and every day. And especially when I meet you in person at all these events. So shout out to you guys. And I'm grateful for you. Without further ado, let me tell you about Sarita. Sarita Mabin is an international speaker, communication expert, and author whose audiences have fun learning how to stay positive, constructively confront tough communication situations, and work together better. During her 20-year speaking career, Sarita has spoken in all 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico, Mexico, Jamaica, Canada, England, Asia, Iceland, and on the prestigious TEDx stage. Sarita is a former university dean of students with a master's degree in counseling, a Toastmasters humorous speech contest winner, and a past president of the National Speakers Association, San Diego chapter. Now, if this doesn't say that this woman is a communication expert, I don't know what else you guys want. I went and got you the best. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Sarita Maven. Welcome to the Redefining Wealth podcast, Sarita. Thank you for having me, Patrice. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, I have been looking forward to our conversation since meeting you at Black Women's Network last year. 
I enjoy listening to you and your tips so much. You know, I was texting my brother the whole time because he has a challenge sometimes with a uh, shout out to Kevin, first of all, my little brother. Um, he has a challenge sometimes with just how to deal with his responses to coworkers <laughs> or other stakeholders, you know, professionally. Mm-hmm. And so as you were sharing and I read your tips right then and there, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to send this to him immediately. And we've been just sharing it amongst our community. So this is definitely something that I've been looking forward to. And it's funny, even my 11 year old daughter who sat off to the side with me, when you were speaking, I ended up having to take her to the restroom and come back. And we sat off to the side. And when an 11 year old is saying, oh, that's good then you know that it's a great tip. <laughs> you know, you're right. That is high praise if you can keep a child's attention and engage them. <laughs> if she's like, I'm going to have to use this on my sixth grade friends, then you know that this is something that we all need. And the sooner, the better. So I want to start with, I, you know, I've been doing my research and, and reading as much as I could about you and some of the stuff that you've done. And I really enjoyed your TEDx talk. It's official. I've turned into my mother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the lines that you talked about is, you know, growing up with this idea that if you can't say something nice, you don't say anything at all. But the truth is, sometimes we just have to say what we need to say. Yes, yes. We can't subscribe to that kind of childhood quip. So can you kind of tell us about how you became this uh, communication expert, if you will? Well, you know, I, I do have to chuckle at the thought of my mother saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Because even as I travel around as a keynote speaker, I, I start out every presentation with that line. And I'm amazed to learn that everyone heard that. <laughs> and, and so one of the things that struck me as a, as a working person and, and previously working in the university arena is that we can all benefit from more truth tellers. And I always feel like sometimes we just keep doing the same things over and over and people are not telling us, you know, you might want to change this. You might want to tweak that because they're saying, well, I shouldn't say anything. I always appreciated when I was a supervisor for a number of years, I always appreciated the staff person who would pull my coattails and say, hey, you know, you might want to think about this or you might want to consider that because otherwise, how do we even improve? That's such a good point. And I love the term truth tellers. I used to tell people when I was a real estate and mortgage broker, they would say, your clients are referring people left and right, but their deal didn't even close. You know, like, why would they refer you business? Like so many people run from telling people the truth or they want to sugarcoat it just way too much instead of getting to what it is. And I believe that you can tell people the truth and leave them with their dignity intact. Well, you know, and I completely agree, Patrice. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite quotes is a, is a kind of a modification of a popular quote, which is say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean. So we don't have to crush people in our attempt to, to share the truth. Why is it, though, especially, I think, as women, do we feel like if I tell the truth, I am crushing people? Like, why do those two things have to go together? Right, right. Well, well, you know, and it's interesting because it, to me, it always reminds me of something, you know, that, that I heard years ago, which is that old assertiveness, I call it assertiveness 101, you know, that that whole continuum of, well, I'll do, I just won't say anything, which is really kind of passive. And then we kind of hold things in, we hold things in because we were told to be nice, especially as women. And then we hold it in until we just blow up and explode. And then we go from saying nothing to ugly. And I always feel like that middle ground, that assertiveness uh, arena is really the goal to try to to find a middle ground where we say something before we're before they've gotten on our last nerve. Right. And then you start using these words like, well, you've always and you never. And Mm -hmm. well, wow. Well, wow. Well, why didn't you tell me that before? Because Mm -hmm. I've just been doing me you know, not necessarily aware of the fact of how it was impacting you. And I don't know that until you tell me. Exactly, exactly. And you may know, having watched my TEDx talk, you you may know that I talk about growing up as the bossy big sister and and trying to, to say, you know, you better do this or you need to do that. You know what you should do? And how we can change that slightly and and say, you know, I need you to or I'd really appreciate or I would like. And so we can even just make those subtle changes in how we talk to each other and share. Um, And I think that's kind of a good compromise. Yeah, I love it. You called it instead of a demand, make a request. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I feel like that's maybe for women, especially uh, a way to say what we need to say and and, and not uh, be aggressive or, or bossy. I also liked that you said in the TEDx talk that we need to just ask for what we want. Can you just talk about that? That alone is to mean like a whole talk within itself. Ask for what we want. We have a long history of being programmed to, you know, be seen and not heard, to be nice and polite, you know, don't make demands. You know, all of that messaging that we've received sometimes keeps us from asking and, and makes us feel like, you know, we're out of line if we're going to ask for something. And I always think my mantra is you don't ask, you don't get. I feel like uh, we can ask for things by using, you, you know, my top 10 phrases. I'm always uh, I'm always talking about my top 10 phrases. And one of my phrases, number five, is would you be willing to? I always feel like we could say to someone, you know, would you be willing to do this? Or would it be possible if we tried that? Or what do you think about? So I think there's ways that we can, as, as a colleague of mine likes to say, we can pull rank when we have no rank to pull. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we can still do that and, and do it in a positive way. And this is not just professionally, this is personally too. Yes, yes, exactly. Sometimes our biggest challenges with communication are in our own homes. So when we say ask for what we want, how do you think that connects to a significant other or a child or a parent or a sibling? Like how, what are some examples of how that plays out when it's not an email with a coworker, you know? Right, right. Well, you know, I think that's the per- perfect example of trying to pull rank when we have no rank to pull <laughs> because we're not the boss in any of them. And even our children, you know, we might think we're the boss of them, but they respond much better if we give them a vote. I always say it's about giving the other person a vote. But if we say, you know, would you be willing to let me know if you're going to be coming home late uh, from school or saying to the husband, you know, would it be possible to help out with some things we need to get ready for the family visit? Or, and, I, and I've got that on the brain uh, with family coming in town in another couple of weeks. So asking, you know, would it be possible to or could you do this or would you be willing to? All of those, I call them collaborative phrases, can be used at home as well. I already hear people, though, objecting to that, Sarita. I already hear people going, I'm not about to ask my 16-year-old, would you be willing? Like, how do you help people get past this idea that just, I don't, it, it shouldn't take all that, or I don't have to do all that, especially right. when you feel like you have rank, and you're like, you know, okay, you grew up with a Black mom, you you may know that you better do what I said. Now, I don't know if your mom was like that, but you know that kind of stereotype, if you will, where it's just very much like, do what I said, because I said so. I remember growing up with being that child that always said, why, why? And my dad in, in particular used to say, because I said so. And, and I always vowed I didn't want to be that parent who the answer to everything was because I said so. But one of the things, my daughter has grown and, and she's uh, now 26, which I can't even believe. Wow. Uh, but um, I remember that when she was a teenager, sometimes I would ask the question, but I'd work in a choice. And so I might say, you know, I, I really need you to straighten up your room before the company comes. Would you be willing to do it right now or would you rather wait until after dinner? But the impl- the implicit message is you will clean up your room. But <laughs> do you want to do it now or, or would you rather wait until we finish dinner? You know, so that choice is a powerful piece there where we give people a choice of, you know, I really need your help. And, and I'm wondering, could you help out with cleaning or, or would, it, would you rather get the groceries because we have to get it all done? I like that. That's that's doable to me. I vowed that I would be a different type of parent as well because my granny just was not having it. (laughs) Just just wasn't having it. But with my daughter, I've even learned that when I do give her context, and I know this is another big parenting thing where people are like, I don't think I have to do all that. Well, I've learned that when I do give her context, if she understands the bigger picture, she complies. Like she just is like, oh, okay, I see why this kind of fits in to the Mm -hmm. bigger scheme of things. And I found it has made it, I mean, she's only 11. So I know people are like, you haven't even gotten to the teen years and all this. But, you know, (laughs) I've seen people who've gone through it, through and through with elementary school kids. So yes, yes. Well, you you know, Patrice, it's funny that you uh, talk about the 11 year old versus teenagers. I I have this kind of warped theory. Maybe it's not so warped, but I have this theory that really there's no difference between the 11 year old, the teenager and the coworker at work. I think everybody wants to know 
context. I love the great word that you use. Because I think, for example, if we're working on a project, say at work, and we've got all these things to do, we're on deadline, you know, we might even say to a coworker, you know, we really have to get a lot done by Friday. And, you know, I'm willing to go ahead and do this and this, you know, what do you, which parts of this do you think you could help out with? So you're still giving them choice. You're providing the big picture context and you're giving them a vote by asking which part could you help with? So it's the same. I find it kind of amusing that the same strategies that we would use with the 11 year old or the teenager uh, also work with our, our coworkers. I like that. I actually got a question from my Purpose Chasers group. That's the private community that I have for like the diehard podcast <laughs> listeners. And Leslie asked, what's the best way to address a staff member who is awesome at what they do, but they have no clue at how their personality comes off as a whole? Like they just talk way too much. Mm -hmm. So it's not about actually getting them engaged in doing the work, but there's still something that you feel like you have to say. Well, you know, I I always think that we can give feedback and, and focus on the positive rather than the negative. So, for example, instead of saying, you know, you just talk way too much, that would obviously be the ugly version Mm -hmm. where we would crush them and we probably would not want to say that. But we could say, you know, I really enjoy the work you do. And I think we could get some good input from the coworkers as well. I'd love for you to make an effort to solicit other people's thoughts or do some listening sessions to hear what other people have to say or uh, give other people a chance to share their ideas as well. There's ways that we can say what we want them to accomplish versus saying what you're doing is bad. You know what? You just took me all the way back to first grade. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a scary thought. <laughs> you did, because I remember, I was actually just telling my husband this not too long ago. I remember first grade Mrs. Boynton's class where every time, you know, a question was asked, I would raise my hand, raise my hand, raise my hand. And I would throw myself into something if she didn't call on me. Like, I just knew I was full of all the right answers. And one day, Mrs. Boynton kept me in for recess, and she said, you have to learn to give other people a voice. We know that you are good at it. We know that you love it. I know that you are smart, that you are passionate. I see you. But some other people just are not as confident with using their voice. And I want you to encourage them to use their voice. Yes. Yes. Stuck with me 30 years now. I love it. That is actually a wonderful example of how feedback can be given, uh, saying what you mean, mean what you say, but not say it mean. And so I love I love that example. That's perfect. You have Sarita's top 10 positive communication phrases. I had to take a picture of this postcard that you gave out at Black Women's Network and send it to my brother and others. (laughs) I want us to kind of go through some of your favorite. Now, it's kind of broken into sections. So there's give them the benefit of the doubt, seek mm-hmm. input, take responsibility, work together. Yes. What are some of your favorites? Well, you know, it's it's perfect that you should ask that question because what we were just talking about really is about seeking input. And ironically, all of my favorites fall in that category. <laughs> um, I think I've already mentioned phrase number five, which is would you be willing to, where we're kind of getting other people's thoughts and input especially when we're not the boss of them, which is most people in this world, um, you know, getting other someone else's input. Um, but I always love phrase number eight. That's probably my number one favorite, which has helped me understand. And I like that one because I always think that our little evil twin, you know, we all have an evil twin. I always think the evil twin is desperately wanting to make that other person understand and see it our way. You know, if it kills me, I'm going to make you understand. And so I feel like it's kind of fun to kind of turn that on its head and instead ask the other person, you know, help me understand your concerns or help me understand what you think may not work about this idea. Or, you know, help me understand the best way to uh, implement your idea. And so we're always needing to get input from others. And we know that when we assume that that takes us down a dark path and uh, we don't want to make assumptions, that tends to be the, the big problem in communication is we make assumptions. You know, I find nowadays, though, I I love the little memes that go around Instagram a lot that kind of talk about the back and forth between coworkers or professional workplace emails. Mm -hmm. So usually when people start with help me understand now, people relate that to being, quote unquote, petty. You know, it's a sad commentary, I think. 
And you've probably heard me say this in my presentation at the Black Women's Network, um, that I always think people, some people use the phrases for evil instead of good. Mm-hmm. And sadly, I feel like all of these positive phrases can be used for evil, because if someone says it with a snarky tone or someone says it sarcastically or they say it and they really don't genuinely mean it, like mm-hmm. they might say, you know, I uh, need your help. But really, they don't need the help. They're, they're just trying to get you to do something. And so I feel like all of these have the potential of being used in an ugly way, because a lot of what goes on with the phrases is what's happening in the background. You know, what's the relationship between you and that person? Uh, what's been the history? If you say, I need your help, but you really don't want their input. Yeah, and we've all seen that happen. You know, well, we want your input, but really it's just lip service. So a lot of what happens and what can go awry is when people use these phrases, but they're disingenuous or they're they're using them as a kind of lip service. Oh, that is so good. And taking into account the history as well is really, really good. So if people have had kind of a contentious, contentious relationship with someone, then trying to use this phrase tomorrow could it not work because of that? Or how can you kind of ease into shifting your communication if there has been quite a bit of tension in the past? What a great question, because sometimes it takes a minute to undo past misunderstandings and past contentiousness in, in relationships. And we might even have to say, you know, again, drawing on the top 10 phrases, uh, my, one of my favorites I use a lot is number four, which is take responsibility. And and to say, you know, I'm concerned that in the past we've had some misunderstandings and I would love to figure out a way that we can, you know, communicate more effectively or be a little more open or uh, be more collaborative or whatever it is we want to be more of, you know, going forward. Mm, That's a good idea. I think that's really going to help. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we may we may start out with the best of intentions, but that looking at the history and what the relationship has been, you know, you can't blame someone who's like, Mm-mm, I don't trust it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially if their past experience with you or with the situation is one of mistrust. You know, it's, it's going to take a minute for them to change that perspective. Yeah, I really like number one, which was what will it take? At the end of the day, I am just always trying to get to the result. <laughs> like, I just, you know, it, whatever it takes to get there, if we can find a way to work together, because the truth is, you know, you don't love everyone you work with. You don't right. love everybody in your family. Let's keep it real. Like, yep, you yep. love them, but you don't necessarily like talking to them. But at the end of the day, Things still have to get done. Progress still needs to be made. And so I really liked what will it take? Because depending on what it is and what the goals and objectives are, I am definitely a what will it take person. Like Mm -hmm. I can put all this to the side. We don't have to hang out on the weekends. You don't have to name your firstborn after me. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, but what will it take to get this accomplished? Yes, yes. Well, you know, and it's so funny because when I first put together the top 10 phrases, I didn't realize I had done this and someone pointed it out to me. They pointed out that the phrases start kind of general in the uh, beginning with number 10 and nine saying, well, you may not realize, perhaps you weren't aware. And then you're trying to get input and you're taking responsibility. And in the end, at the end of the day, as you say, it's what will it take? And so someone pointed out that they start general and then they kind of go into a laser sharp focus uh, at the end. And and I think sometimes we use phrase number one when we're at our wit's end, when we've tried everything else and it's not working. And we have to say, you know, what will it take to get your cooperation on this project? Or what will it take to get your help around the house? Or what will it take to get your uh, your input? So whatever, whatever the issue is at the end of the day that you're right, that's what we want to know. What will it take to get you on board? Yeah. Do you find that this works this style of communication works much better in verbal form or in written form? Because I think sometimes things can still be misunderstood via email. Mm -hmm. I like to just get on the phone and talk to people, but I realize that a lot of people are not confrontational. I don't see it as confrontation, but, but I guess that's also, you know, a whole framing thing or perspective thing. You know, I'm always struck by how 
misunderstood things can be via email. And, and, and in fact, I, um, I've been doing a new t- uh, speaking topic the last couple of years based on the request of some clients. They said, you know, Sarita, you're talking about communication, but we're all on email right now. We're all texting. And uh, how do you how does that change communication? So I've been I've, I've been doing a topic called how to maintain high touch relationships in high tech times. And one of the things that I share is three clues that you should choose to pick up the phone instead of email or text. And the the three clues that I share, I think, might be relevant to what we're talking about. Um, And the first one is a sensitive subject. When there's a sensitive subject, um, meaning there might be some issues that don't need to be in an email. Or secondly, when there's a um, conflict. You know, people try to solve world peace via email, which does not really work. And thirdly, when there's a back and forth, I I use the rule of three, when there's been a a need for clarification, when you've gone back and forth at least three times, uh, and when there's sensitive subjects and when there's a conflict. I love that. I know when it's time for me to pick up the phone, Sarita, because I I get what they call Twitter fingers. <laughs> Uh-oh. What is the Twitter fingers? That sounds interesting. Twitter fingers are when you are like starting to type really fast and hard. Oh. You're like, oh, OK. Like you've made up in your mind that this this is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So rather than do that and send something out into, you know, cyberspace that I cannot get back. I yes. have a moment close my phone or, you know, get away from that email for the moment and then take a few steps back, breathe, whatever, walk the dog, come back. And then I'm like, I I decide whether I need to just call them. Yes. Yes. To call them. Yeah. And it sounds like, it sounds like you use the age old strategy of going, taking a walk, taking some deep breaths, count to 10 and all of that before you go back and decide what you need to do to communicate the best way. Yeah. Because by the time I do decide to call, I don't want to call in the midst of like, you know, steam coming out of my ears or with the furrowed brow. Because, you, I mean, let's face it, when when something like that comes across via text or email or whatever, you we all have this face that we make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're like, what? What is that? (laughs) You know, mine kind of includes like tilting my head to the side. I have one eye closed. My lip is all kind of up in the corner on one side. I know the <laughs> face, right? Yep. Yep. So when that face happens, it's like, nah, you probably shouldn't. You probably need to take a moment um, and and then come back to that. And within a timely matter, you can't like leave it alone. Because usually I find that if you take too long to address it, once they've hit send, they feel like it's good or what I said is what I said. And so yep, exactly <laughs> come back to it three weeks later, like, you know, cause then that's just weird. So, well, and you know, and that's, that is the, the, one of the weird things about the email is it's not in real time. And so we, someone may say something and then that time lapse, we're always trying to read into that. Why didn't they respond? It's been two days. What are they thinking? You know, this you know, can be read into all of that as well. Uh, one, thing I, one thing I kind of share a, a lot, which I enjoy um, doing with emails, I always joke about how you know, we do a spell check, but we should probably do a please and thank you check. Uh-huh. And one of the uh, one of the things I always do when I do in emails, I go look back and see, OK, does this email sound harsh? What can I do to make it sound more personable? Maybe I need to say this and get back to me by five to say, can you please get back to me by five o'clock? Thank you so much. So there's ways to soften the email because it, it, without some of the, the little soft edges, it really could come across as harsh in, in, the, uh, in the email. So I, I actually call that put some sugar on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whenever we hire my COO, Gwendolyn, laughs about this all the time. You know, whenever we bring on new team members, I also have to remind them that they're an extension of me. Mm-hmm. And so just because you're trying to get direct into the point, you still represent my brand. If they send an email and get an email response that this is an extension of me. And so I remind them to like double check and put some sugar on it. Like if. Yes, exactly. And so I like the please and thank you for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, because it does matter. It goes a long way because I can say personally, when people send me short or snarky emails, I, I'm not really quick to reply. Like, I, it doesn't make me want to, they, they didn't enroll me in their vision. Like, you need yes, me yes. to do something. You're asking me to do something. 
and you're not even kind <laughs> with the delivery. Now it's not that I need a whole bunch of good morning, beautiful. How was your day? Tell right. me about it's not that. Uh, you can still be direct, but honor you can still honor the space in the process. Just create a space that's respectful, you know, mm-hmm. we can and I will reciprocate, but I don't like when people make quick requests of me and they don't even acknowledge that they they want their lack of planning to now become my emergency. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, I, I really think that um, at the end of the day, we do need to periodically check in with someone via a real conversation. I mean, I sometimes... I may go weeks sometimes emailing, emailing and texting, but it's always nice to actually have a real conversation from time to time. Just, you know, make sure we're having a, a real time relationship. Yeah, I agree. There's something else that you said the day I saw you spoke. You talked about these three P's that I thought were brilliant. Um Can you go through those? It was about taking things personally. Yes, yes. And, you know, and I do have to give credit to uh, Dr. Martin Seligman uh, because I borrowed that from his work. He's the kind of the the granddaddy of the whole positive psychology movement. It's really about are we going to stay positive or are we going to let somebody derail us and, and become negative? And the first one you're right is not taking things personally. The second P is realizing it's not permanent. You know, right now we may hate this, we hate this, we hate this, but this too shall pass. One one of my mother's other little pieces of wisdom, uh, this too shall pass. It's not permanent. And then lastly, are we going to let it ruin our big picture? Sometimes one thing will happen and the person will go around the rest of the week with a pouty look on their face, taking it out on everyone far and wide. And now their whole entire picture has been tainted. So not taking it personally, realizing it's not permanent and don't let it ruin our our big picture. I think that's a great way to to keep a a proper perspective, even as we're dealing with challenges and and people who get on our nerves. (laughs) Right. And that and that's what I really connect to that. Is it going to matter in the big picture? I connect that to the what will it take? Mm -hmm. You know, depending on who it is, again, we don't always have a choice Mm -hmm. in who we work with. And I'm like. The big picture is this project or this deal that I'm working on is 30 days. You know, mm-hmm. It's 45 yeah. days. It's two weeks. It's whatever. Like in the big picture, I want to do a great job and get my check. <laughs> like, right. Right. But, you know, or close my deal or do whatever. So if that includes having to deal with someone who has a personality that is less than desirable to me, the big picture is it's not permanent and I know what the end result is. And I'm not going to take it personally because this is probably how they show up with everyone. And that's right. Most yeah. People yeah. Allow it because I think going back to the beginning, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all. And so they've been allowed to do this for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. You know, I'm just an innocent bystander. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and the funny thing is we tend to be quick to make other people's problems our problem. So someone comes in and they're saying, oh, it's awful. I had an awful weekend and oh, I can't believe it. And they're just basically venting and whining. And so then we take that on and decide to, that we're going to let it ruin our day. And and so I think sometimes when people are having issues, we have to remember, you know, when I can empathize, I can listen to them, I can sympathize, uh, you know. But I don't have to take that on and, and take it personally. And, and I always think that it's, it's, a wonder, it's a wonderful quote. Someone said that when people make a comment or they act a negative way, it says more about who they are than we than who we are. Right. Tim Story, who was on the podcast last year, said, just because you're in a drama, you don't have to be dramatic. And so we have this saying, I don't care, I don't bring on, which means when people do bring you drama, or some conversation that you don't necessarily want to be a part of, you don't mm-hmm. have to engage. Like you can literally just, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? yep. And let exactly. go over your head. You don't have to participate at all. Participation is a choice. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So at the end of the day, we, we have to decide, are we going to, as I always like to say, are we going to be the person who brightens the room when they come in the room? Or are we going to be the person who brightens the room when we leave the room? So we decide how we're going to show up. Oh, that's good. I haven't, I've heard that before, I believe, but not a long time. And uh, thanks for that reminder. I definitely want to be the person who brightens the room when I walk in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the goal. If people have a sigh of relief when I leave, 
<laughs> like that is. Yeah, that would be a bummer. I think that would be a real bummer to be that person. Well, I think the biggest bummer is being married to that person or like being someone who has to deal with that or you make a choice to deal with that all day. Like, I I don't know what it would feel like to be super excited every time my kid left or my husband <laughs> left. Or, that's like a whole nother thing. And I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with it. Um, I had one lady back in the day, uh, you know, I was speaking to a group of women and a, a lot of the young women were talking about they couldn't wait to get married. And, and a woman finally raised her hand and she's like, listen, I'm here trying to learn what to do after I get divorced because I can't wait to get divorced. And everybody was like, whoa. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, it's interesting because I speak to a, at a fair amount of places where they have negativity. I mean, I love speaking at conferences and doing keynotes, and that's probably my favorite. But I feel for the people that work in those places where they're sent to a mandatory negativity workshop. They're told, you know, you all need to get fixed. You got a bad attitude. And one of the things that strikes me is that when I'm in those kind of places or talking to people who are in situations that are negative, we have to acknowledge the fact that they aren't going to be able to change these certain people, whether it be their husband, their wife, or their coworker, but they can choose to counteract it by spending time with positive people. And so finding some things that they can do that are positive outlets to almost counteract the negative, to neutralize it in some ways, is probably the better, more doable strategy. Um, you know, finding some positive outlets and things you enjoy. You know, I'm a gym person. I love going to Zumba. And sometimes when I... I um, am irked by something or someone like I'll go off and I'll spend time with some positive people, dance to the music. An hour later, you know, I come back and I feel better. So finding positive outlets sometimes is a more, at least in the short term, a more doable strategy for staying positive in spite of those around us. What's a solution for the long term? Well, for the long term is at some point we may have to figure out uh, how to have a conversation with them. Sometimes it it requires us having objective people uh, being involved in in the conversation. You know, maybe maybe we're when I think about relationships, it's like, well, maybe we're not able to be objective anymore. So you hear people going to marriage counselors. Bottom line is to ask the other person, are you willing to work on having a more positive relationship? And, and that's whether it be at work, a coworker, or, or whether it be a spouse and, and figuring out a way to look at changing our communication, get some additional input. Uh, I, I'm not a, a person that's, you know, I'm on my, my, as I always say, I had my practice husband. So now I'm on my, my new husband of four years. And one of the things with my first husband, I remember, you know, he was not the type who wanted to get any input. He says, you know, I don't want to hear anybody else's thoughts. I don't want to go to marriage counseling. And, you know, for a while I could counteract that with my own, my own positive activities. But at some point, if he says, I'm not really willing to work on this relationship, well, then it might be game over. So I think all, all jobs, all work relationships, all committees, all marriages, you know, all partnerships aren't meant to necessarily last forever. That's true. I, I know. What a, that's a, I say, oh, bummer. <laughs> that's true. No, I mean, purpose is seasonal and so are partnerships. They yes. Can, you know, and some seasons just last longer than others. But, yeah. you know, knowing that is a possibility, because I, uh, to your point, I, sometimes I think people feel that they're broken. Like, mm-hmm. why can't I make this relationship work? Why can't I make this venture, this partnership, this whatever work? And sometimes we do have to accept that it takes more than just you Mm -hmm. to make it work. And if other people are not willing, we had an episode about boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, if other people are not willing to respect uh, those boundaries that keep you healthy and safe, Mm -hmm. at some point, you have to accept that that might not be the right place, you know, department, relationship, whatever for you. That's right. And, you know, it's it's interesting because I love the fact that you bring up boundaries, because I think sometimes we do have to say we do have to set boundaries and we do have to say, I'm willing to do this for you if you can help me with this. Or I'm willing to do this for you as soon as I finish what I'm working on. I would say it's if, as soon as and when, uh, because we have to sometimes say, I, I'd be happy to do that for you when I'm done with this, or I'd be happy to go with you there as soon as I finish 
whatever. So I always think if, when, and as soon as are great boundary words, Um, because those are ways that we say, you know, I'm happy to help you and I'll do it as soon as, or I'll do it when, or if you give me the information, I'd be happy to get that for you. We need to use those boundary setting words, I call them, in order to uh, have people not just run roughshod over us. Right. Right. And again, make their lack of planning possibly your emergency. That's right. That's right. You know, um, and I think, too, that uh, we were talking about the top 10 phrases and and I was talking about the history. I think we can kind of talk about that here uh, as well is, you know, what's the history? Have they completely disregarded your request when you say I need your help or, you know, I would appreciate, you know, would you be willing to? And the answer is always no, 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 no. Then the question becomes, you know, I'm concerned that uh, you're not willing to put the effort in or I'm concerned that you haven't been willing to help. You know, I'm wondering what we can do to resolve that. Mm, I love that. I love how it kind of flows just like from one section to the other again. I think it's I think it's great. I'm actually going to put these in the show notes if that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that'll be good. And make sure that people know. So you have some ways to start these emails and start these conversations fresh. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarita, before I let you go, what we do at the end of every episode is I ask redefining wealth rapid wisdom questions. And so I'm going to ask you four things and just tell us the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, okay, great. How do you define success? I think enjoying what you do And making a difference. Mm -hmm. How do you define wealth in three words or less? Feeling that you have enough for yourself and enough to share with others. Sarita, that was a lot of words. Three words or less. Oh, (laughs) Enough, self, others. (laughs) We got you. What's one book that has redefined how you see wealth? That's an interesting question. I'll have to think about that one for a minute. Let me ponder that. And we'll come back to that one. As they say on Family Feud, pass, I'll come back. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you are my first pass, which is okay. It's funny. The audience doesn't know, but I have edited out like four minutes of thinking like in the past where people are thinking about it, but you're the first to actually negotiate a pass. So I will allow that. Um, The next one is fill in the blank. My name is, and for me, the truth about wealth is. Okay, uh, my name is Sarita. And for me, the truth about wealth is that it is possible. Yes, indeed. Okay, what's one book that has redefined how you see wealth? I would choose to say the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, Mm -hmm. um, because she talks about women in particular and how sometimes we opt out and that we should lean in and go full out, play full out. Because otherwise, the things we might have for us, we may miss them if we don't play full out and lean in to every opportunity. Love it. I love it. Sarita, thank you so much for being here. I think that you are going to save a lot of jobs this year in 2019. (laughs) Maybe even some relationships along the way. <laughs> right. Definitely relationships, jobs, friendships, a lot of things where we we just get to ask for what we want. And we that, that's right. That's right. Do it with dignity and without being mean and without being bossy. But if we use the right language and have the right intentions behind the words that we select that we really can get folks to cooperate with us. No, I, I think so. And I, I think that's the goal. And and if I might put in a plug before we go, we were talking about the please and thank you. And, and I, I actually talked about that in my monthly, what do you say, communique, which is my monthly e-newsletter. Mm-hmm. And um, if people are interested, they can actually text Sarita Talk to 22828 and they immediately go on the email list and as a result of that they get an automatic uh, pdf with 50 phrases for all occasions oh definitely we need these 50 phrases i've been incorporating the 10 i've really taken away three or four that i'm really using more but Mm -hmm. i love having a pool of things that i could choose from to help Mm -hmm. me once i get back from that walk and need to make that call. <laughs> so That's I will great. definitely make sure that I reiterate that and that we include it in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here, Sarita. I appreciate you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Patrice, and enjoy the rest of your day. 
All right, you guys, was Sarita not incredible? Now, you know this is an episode you need to listen to multiple times because these nuggets and these takeaways, especially her communication tips, we have to use this stuff, guys. I mean, there was so much jam-packed in this, but I think one of the things that really stands out to me is that, ladies, we are not bossy when we are being assertive. It is okay for us to ask for what we want. It is okay for us to do it also in a way that allows people to keep their dignity. We can tell people the truth and leave them with their dignity intact. And the thought of denying and betraying who we are in order to make somebody else feel comfortable all the time, that's just not going to work. That whole, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, that doesn't work anymore. We have to be able to stand in our truth. That's a part of what being a powerful woman is. And so I'm going to keep working on all of these tips, you know, that Sarita gave us and really remembering not to take things personally, remembering that nothing is permanent and not allowing things to ruin the big picture. I would love to hear from you. And it's funny. I had to incorporate this just the other day, just the other night. I had an exchange on Facebook of all places. And, you know, I don't like to hang out on Facebook with someone that I went to high school with and they were so nasty. And it was just so unnecessary. And I really couldn't wrap my mind around what was going on. But then I remembered what Tim's story said. Just because you're in a drama, you don't have to be dramatic. And participating in other people's drama or negativity is a choice. So I would love to hear from you because this is going to come up. I guarantee you, now that you've heard this, you are responsible. (laughs) You are responsible. So now that you've heard this episode, I know that there are going to be plenty of opportunities for you to put Sarita's tips in place. So please let us know how you have put it in place. Share what your aha moments are. Share that big, audacious, scary, bold thing that you are going to do, that conversation that you are going to have because of being empowered by this conversation. I would love to cheer you on and continue to encourage you. So find me in social media, Seek Wisdom PCW. I will be tagging Sarita. Come to my Instagram page, show her some love uh, and let us know how you felt about the episode. Now, as usual, I want you to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later.